Hey, good afternoon, everybody from Buggy One. We are experiencing some excellent light tonight, and we have two sparring bears right outside our window. Maybe Steve, you want to talk about what's going on and uh, what are they? What are they doing? We got two uh, two big male polar bears that have been kind of just laying in the willows all day while the wind has been howling. And now they're facing off and they're starting to do a little sparring action here, testing each other's prowess. We think that this sparring activity is related to their ability to sense each other's fighting strength, fighting prowess, so that they minimize the amount of injuries that they might inflict on each other coming in the spring. It looks like we might have had uh, just a brief bout and then one of them decided he doesn't want that anymore. However, the challenger is moving in, or the champion, I guess, depending on which way you want to face it. And uh, so we'll see. Maybe we'll get some more action here right as the sun is setting over the tundra just off of Churchill, Manitoba. Okay. We've had a wonderful day here today. We uh, were uh, filming live with BBC Two on a program that they're doing all about the Arctic and the challenges that uh, various aspects of life in the Arctic are facing uh, with global warming. Uh, they've uh, been visiting mines, they've been visiting Greenland, they've been visiting oil fields, they've been visiting all kinds of places across the Arctic that uh, are facing changes as a result of a warming world. And one of the places they're visiting is right here in Churchill, Manitoba, where they want to look at polar bears, the challenges polar bears are facing, and uh, you know perhaps why polar bears have sort of become the fuzzy face of climate change. So, Steve, it's uh, it's a pretty spectacular night tonight. Huh? The light is just beautiful, and, and the weather today has been crazy. We've, we've seen a little bit of everything, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we were, we were forecast to see uh, 90 kilometers per hour of wind. I don't think we ever saw that, but the wind was really howling for a while. We had blowing snow. We had quite a lot of new snow come in and redistributed itself across the tundra as the wind worked it. Uh, and then it calmed down this afternoon, and uh, the uh, light is now really, really nice for evening light. We had uh, uh, bears outside of our buggy almost the whole time that we were filming with BBC. And uh, it wasn't our doing, although we would like to claim that it was our doing, that these bears sat up and did really nice, cute things, just as if they were on cue when the BBC uh, personalities were out doing their closing statements and such. You might have been able to see some of that happening if uh, you were watching the Lodge South camera. Uh, on the explore.org site. Uh, it was kind of overlooking us and our activities today. And uh, if you saw the buggy bouncing around a little, uh, the buggy one, Tundra buggy cam, you may have seen uh, sort of the evidence of our activities. Now this guy is just starting to lay down. I was hoping they were going to spar there, Steve. It looked like one was going to go after the other in this beautiful light. That would have been... Yeah, that would have been pretty spectacular. They did one little bout of boxing, and then uh, one of them walked away. Oh, oh here oh. they go again. Oh, Maybe that light so. is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I might have to pull my sunglasses out, and like I was saying earlier, this would be the fourth... Oh, oh there, there we go. there we go. Oh, yeah. Nice. Ding, ding, ding is right. We, we've got Jeff York in the background there. He just goes, he just uh, said ding, ding, ding. So the Tundra Buggy drivers that are up here, uh, because the radios are broadcast live, you know, as they communicate between the different buggies, they have to have a code in order to make sure that uh, they can sort of talk about what's happening out the window without letting everybody know. So ding, ding, ding is the indicator for sparring so we just saw some of that yeah now last year we had a fellow up here who his day job is actually broadcasting boxing events and so he was doing commentary as we were watching sparring uh that was uh just like he would be doing if he was uh, uh, narrating a boxing event now it looks like maybe they're going off to find another place to fight. Hopefully not. Out. Stay stay put, guys. The light is too good. Yeah. 
Of course, right. soon it's going to be dark. It will. Then then the light won't be very good at all, right? No, it's going to be pretty dark here pretty soon. Yeah. Oh, look at this. They're turning our way now. Yeah, so there's a pretty yeah. heavy so overcut. Are, oh, go ahead. two good-sized males out here. We've been watching them all day. And uh, these are guys, uh, they don't seem to be too terribly afraid of each other, but I wouldn't want to meet either one of them in a dark alley. Definitely not. So, Steve, a couple of these guys are, or both of these guys are banged up in different ways. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it, it could mean a lot of things, but the most likely scenario is that uh, they've gotten their scars when they've been engaged in real competitions for mates in the spring of the year. The sparring that we see this time of year, they bite each other sometimes, but typically they don't really injure each other very much. It's more a test of skill and a test of strength. Uh, in the spring of the year, they can really go at it. And we've seen some severe injuries in uh, Alaska when we've been out there trying to catch bears to, to, to tag them and monitor how they're doing. And uh, you come up on a bear, you'll have uh, a female bear that might be followed by two or three or more uh, other bears. And uh, those other bears are almost always big males that are trailing and they're fighting with each other along the way. So, so one of these bears here, he's got a scar on his nose. You may have seen him earlier. He's got a kind of a V-shaped sh scar. And the other one appears to be missing part of his ear. So they fought pretty hard yeah. at one point. Yeah, we've seen bears that have been fighting. The, the, the ear is just kind of dangling by a thread. And, uh, of course, the ear doesn't grow back. They can heal much more rapidly than you might think they would, but an ear doesn't grow back. And uh, the most amazing injury that I ever saw was when we had two bears fighting. Jeff York, who's here today uh, with us watching these bears, he and I captured a bear in Alaska years ago. It had been fighting with another bear, and the one had this big gushing wound off of his shoulder. Well, the bear we caught first uh, didn't have as obvious an external wounds, although he was missing an ear. I guess that's pretty obvious. But uh, he had a huge gash in his belly and you could actually put your fingers in through the the stomach Ooh. wall and feel his intestines oh man and he was still in the game he was still trying to keep up with these other guys and uh, uh, interestingly just to show the ability of these animals to uh, heal themselves he uh, uh, we caught him two or three years later and he was pursuing another female that severe injury that would have been fatal probably for a human uh, was all healed up it just felt like there was a rope under his skin so these animals have a tremendous ability to uh, to survive abuse and to live on uh, however one of the things we know from uh, our studies of polar bears is that these big males have a lot shorter lifespan than uh, females and that's because almost from the time they're born they're starting to compete with each other to test each other's strength and uh, so we've had uh, females in our study in Alaska that uh, lived over 30 years but uh, about the oldest male I think we've ever found is about 24 years and uh, if they get into their early 20s they're doing really well. What have you seen in, uh, in the Hudson Bay area as far as ages of these animals Andy? It, it's just about the same. Uh, we can get uh, females producing cubs here. I think uh, 28 years was the oldest we had for producing cubs. Uh, for adult males, 24, 25 is, is basically looking like an old swayback horse, but that age they're pretty thinned out. They don't have much muscle mass, and they're on their way out. It's interesting because when we look at uh, the breeding history from the genetics, um, you know, we can see that most of the males that are breeding, if they're doing anything, it's about 15, 16, 17 years of age. And after that, it's pretty much game over. Uh, the wear and tear of, of the breeding season is just incredibly tough. I mean, over the years, we've seen bears that have lost eyes, broken limbs. We had one or two bears, actually a couple that had their whole end of their nose, the whole black part ripped off. No way. Broken jaws. Yeah, it, it's broken limbs. It's uh, it's pretty serious for these bears, and they take uh, the competition in the springtime pretty pretty darn seriously. So it, it's interesting. I mean, this guy was here. I'm pretty sure it's the same bear. I think we called him Van Gogh last year because he's missing his ear. And um, 
I think it doesn't really affect him that much. Give him kind of a, a mean, nasty sort of swagger. When you look at his head, you think that's a pretty tough-looking bear. But uh, he's back this year. He's in pretty good shape. He looks like he's in his mid-teens. He's kind of in peak of body condition. And, and that's why we've got these two, you know, really sort of prime-age males right next to each other. Uh, a younger bear wouldn't come in and fight with one of these guys. They'd stay plenty clear of these two. So if folks are tuning in to the Explore Camps yesterday, they would have seen kind of a playful, smaller bear running around. These bears, how much bigger do you think these bears are than the than that small little female we saw cruising yesterday? Oh, the little female? Oh, these guys got a, a couple of three, four hundred pounds on that female. She's she's a Tinkerbell compared to these guys. These these guys would be pretty sizable. We saw them up moving around near the lodge earlier and um these are a couple of bruisers and you also got to think that these guys haven't eaten anything for several months now so these guys have been on land for at least three months and the the cool thing here is that um they're they've also lost about one kilogram so over two pounds of body weight per day that they've been on land so um, when they came on off the sea ice, these guys were uh, pretty round, had big fat butts. Oh, he's trying to catch a bull. Yeah, this guy rolling here. Sorry to interrupt, Andy, but this guy rolling around right now just had a bull run by him. I don't know if you guys could see that on the uh, on the camera there. That's wild. Well, that'd be like uh, having one M&M, and I noticed that Jeff just brought out a bag of M&Ms, so uh, that, 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 that's gonna... not going to help a polar bear too much uh, get through this ice-free period. Well, and our really microphone wants. cords are too short. We can't get over there. Yeah, we can go over there, and uh, yeah, we're not going over there. We're not going to, well, no, to get the Jeff's M&Ms, I'm saying. Oh, the M&M, no, he brought them right there, right here. The oh, M&Ms are here. You not that I trouble. need any of those, <laughs> but... Uh, Anyways, it's this guy's just having a good roll around. It, it's funny, you know, you you look at him and, you know, my dog, I have a golden retriever at home and he does just exactly the same sort of stuff, just rolls around on his back and I think it just feels good. Yeah. I think he wants you to go over there and itch his belly, Andrew. Andy. Yeah, well, no, I, I you can call me Andrew. I, I my mom my, my mom does. So when so well when she's you know, she doesn't get mad at me much anymore. <laughs> Maybe if I don't phone home. But you know, bottom line is uh, I don't think I'm going over there to scratch his belly because tell you the truth, I don't think he would really appreciate it. You know? My dog does, but you know, that's that's the difference between a golden retriever and a polar bear. Hmm. I'm gonna pass the microphone over here to Steve. So do we have some technical difficulties there, BJ? Always. No, apparently we're still live streaming, is that correct? It is a beautiful sunset here on the shores of Hudson Bay today so it's uh, it's been a, a bizarre start to the day because it started out calm it was sunny and then you could sort of see something off in the distance and they were calling for whiteout conditions uh, never really quite got there but uh, it was pretty blustery and, and blowing today and it was an uh, interesting day out here working with BBC2 to do this live broadcast uh, went off without a hitch and it was uh, it was fun Dr. Steve Amstrup was out there chatting away with Kate Humble, and I was out on the other buggy talking to Gordon Buchanan with the BBC. It was, uh, it was an interesting show. I gather, Steve, that they're going to repackage this for probably public broadcasting system in the U.S. That's uh, what I understand. Yeah. So, so what we did today will be viewable uh, sometime in the near future all across the U.S., and apparently it was already viewable across Canada. Yeah, it was it was kind of cool. I'm at the University of Alberta, and one of the people in my finance department uh, sent me an email today, and 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 it was kind of cool because there was a picture. Her nephew lives in Wales, and and she he uh, was watching the show, and you know my picture popped up, and he, and because I'm affiliated with the University of Alberta, he took a picture of his television, sent it to his aunt in Edmonton, Canada, and then she sent it on to me. So. It's pretty cool. I, I think last night, the first of the of the three episodes reached 2.6 million people in the United Kingdom. So um, that's pretty pretty cool. And I guess uh, 
they also had some pretty intense competition against uh, some other shows on BBC One and, and the other channels yeah. in the UK. They, uh, this was apparently a record for BBC Two. And uh, it was also a first time of them trying to do a live broadcast in a remote location like this. And there's a lot of moving pieces here. If you could see Buggy One now, I mean, Buggy One is always kind of a busy place because of the electronics that we have up here, the lighting, and uh, the things to keep our internet connection going so we can pipe our information back uh, like we're doing now. But there's also these big panels in here of electronics that Europe. And so it's really a, a lot of moving pieces, and it has come off quite well. And uh, this, uh, the people that are doing this program are really interested in getting a good message out about the challenges that we face in protecting polar bears in the future and how that, those challenges are connected to challenges in many other aspects of life, of, of uh, human life all across the world. One of the things I was just going to note, we've got this bear, you know, where the sun's going down. And, and if you look over the bear's rump and a little bit way off on the horizon there, you see that little spiky bit? Well, that's now what we call the, the Churchill Northern Study Center, but that's actually uh, the remains of a rocket launch system that was uh, established here a number of years ago, operated back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and it was set up to actually study the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights. And I remember we were here years ago, and, and it was the last time it was actually NASA was up here, and they shipped all these, uh, a couple of rockets up here, and they were shooting stuff up into the Aurora. To, to see what's going on. Churchill's on on a band of high activity for Aurora. And, and so what they were doing is they, it was kind of cool. They were out there, shot this rocket up, and they exploded right up in the Aurora. And they, they shot all these barium crystals. And then they looked at how it aligned in, in the Aurora. The, the cool thing is they didn't have to do it at, at night. They actually shot the rocket off during the day. And it, uh, it was cool because we were out here in the springtime uh, looking for mothers with little cubs, we were doing a study of them, and we were actually out on the sea ice because, of course, you don't want to be down downstream. It used to be what was called the rocket range, and you don't want to be down there because <laughs> if the rocket doesn't work, that's where it's coming down, and that's where it's supposed to come down. Um, but anyways, we were out on the sea ice, and all of a sudden we heard this huge bang, scared the living uh, the Jesus out of me. But anyways, um, and of course that was a rocket taking off and separation of the stages going up uh, uh, but anyways it was I, I figured for sure the helicopter had just blown up behind us but it was it was pretty cool that was a uh, long time ago wow that would have been neat to see and if you uh, tune in to the explore aurora camera it is actually stationed there at the churchill northern study center so it's pretty fitting that they used to study the aurora there and now you uh, you explore cam viewers can check out the Aurora after dark here in the Churchill area. We were we were chatting with uh, with Grant from the Churchill Northern Study Center last week, and he said something like, uh, "Churchill here, the town of Churchill experiences 300 days of Aurora every year. So if you look up at the night sky, wow. you'll be able to see through these clouds." Up to 300 nights a year, Churchill, you'd be able to see it. Now this time of year, it's very cloudy. So you may not be able to see it. Although the other night, um, the aurora was so intense, you could see it through the cloudy sky. And uh, it was pretty spectacular. So what you're saying, BJ, is not that you can see the aurora 300 nights a year, but that it's going on up there, even if it's a cloudy day and, and you can't see through the clouds. Yeah, precisely. Yep. Uh, if you were to take an airplane through, uh, through the clouds and, and get to the top, then you'd be able to see them. But, uh, this yeah. time of year, the, the weather here is often cloudy and foggy and kind of gray. And uh, uh, so you wouldn't, on a night like this, unless this, this cloud layer that we have above us moves away, we wouldn't be able to see the aurora from here. But later on in the winter, there's a lot of people that come to Churchill, like in January and February, to see the aurora because in the dead of winter, there's a lot of crystal clear weather here where you can see forever and you get a really really nice view and the company that sponsors us here frontiers north does uh, aurora tours where they come out with buggies 
on with uh, passengers who specifically come up here to see and photograph the Aurora Borealis. And so it's uh, quite an interesting place in that regard as well to think of uh, the magic that's going on on the ground around us and the magic that occurs in the sky above us. And I guess if we just want to round out all the, uh, the things that are happening here in Churchill, in the summertime, the blugas are here. And maybe some of you tuned into the beluga camera. But something like 3,000 beluga whales come to the Churchill River to spend their summer. And uh, that is another spectacular place. I mean, it's just there's belugas everywhere you look. I haven't been up here, BJ, but I, I've heard people describe it as you could almost walk across the backs of the belugas and cross from one side of the river to the other. Is that true? Yeah, it's pretty much that thick. I mean, they're in there, and, and it's, it's really pretty neat. I, I think you're telling a story there. You're not going to walk across any whales because they tend to die. But, I mean, you'd have a hard time. But it, it is pretty sweet. I haven't done been out there for a number of years, but it, it's pretty cool when you're out in the estuary and the whales are coming around. They're super curious. And, and it's really neat because, you know, most whales, they can't bend their necks, right? If you actually look at their skeletons, all the neck vertebrae are all fused together. For some reason, beluga whales are one of the few whales that actually can turn their heads. So it's really sweet because they come up to you and they, they turn their heads and they actually come right up to the boats and look at you. And they're kind of friendly little things. And, you know, when I was, a, you know, we had small kids and in, in Canada, at least, there's this very famous children's singer that, that has a song, a guy called Rafi. And uh, he has a song, Baby Beluga. If you've, not, if you've never heard the song, Baby Beluga, then you, you probably should. Um, and anyways, um, he lives on the West Coast in Canada. And, and, and that song, every time I ever see a beluga whale, I always think of that song. And I think about my kids who, well, they're not kids anymore. But anyways, it's pretty cool. Um, the other thing I'll warn you to do is, is not, not look at YouTube videos for narwhal, narwhal, um, singing in the ocean. If you look at that, you'll, you'll get an ear... You'll get an earworm of epic proportion. It is. It's, <laughs> I, I actually uh, uh, sometimes when before class when I'm teaching at the university, I put that uh, that song on. It's um, it's it's like they say the narwhal is the Jedi of the sea. So, anyways, it's yeah. I'm sorry for for recommending that you don't look at that. <laughs> well, thanks, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Don't look at that. We're gonna put it on. I don't think Steve has ever seen it. So no. We're gonna, we're gonna play it here later on. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I don't uh, it's need any earworms. But, <laughs> but it but it's in it, it's interesting because you know we we've been focusing on polar bears and polar bears, of course, are are sort of the iconic species when it comes to climate change. But it's, it's important to also consider that the prey of polar bears, ring seals, and bearded seals are also dependent on the sea ice. And, and the reason that beluga whales and narwhal can make a living in the Arctic Ocean is because they do have the sea ice as a protection uh, from predators. And the main predator they're trying to stay away from is killer whales. And killer whales with that big dorsal fin can't go into the sea ice. So it's a... Uh, it's it's interesting. It's uh, the whole ecosystem that we're we're talking about when we're talking and thinking about climate change. We we focus on polar bears, of course, with Polar Bears International and and my research group. But it, it goes far beyond that. Yeah, as uh, Andy was talking about, belugas are highly adapted to a sea ice environment, and because they don't have a big dorsal fin like killer whales do or some other whales do, they can come up through thin ice and actually break it with their backs so that they can continue to forage under the ice, to move around under the ice, and then come up through the ice to breathe. There are times when they are fooled or uh, don't move as fast as they should, and they can become entrapped in the ice where the ice becomes too thick for them to break through. And in some of those cases, we actually see where polar bears figure out the last places that belugas in an area may be able to come up to breathe and then you can see some kind of significant carnage because the polar bears will wait around until they can catch belugas and a polar bear can can really and I've seen it can pull a beluga out of the water you'd think that it would be hard to pull an animal that large out of the water but they tire them out and they can pull them out and uh, Andy I presume you've seen that around here you know I've never seen that here um I, I've certainly seen uh, stories and seen some of the Inuit history of that, so northern people talk about it. Um, there's been several documented cases in the scientific mm -hmm. literature as well, but 
the uh, Inuit have a name for that, and they call it savsat. And one of the uh, a savsat is just this opening where the whales get trapped. And one of the concerns is that as the sea ice becomes more dynamic in the springtime, it, uh, it, they may start to occur more often. And these can occur for narwhal and yeah. uh, beluga whales. And so there's, there's great concern about the impacts of that are on we done? populations. My wife just uh, texted in and said, tell Andy baby belugas are gray. Oh yeah, baby, baby <laughs> belugas are really good. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's kind of cool there. But that song is, is yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, baby belugas or narwhal narwhal? Well, you, you, narwhal narwhal is an earworm. Just be careful. Uh, baby beluga in Rafi, yeah, yeah, he's cool. We were actually on Salt Spring Island. We, we, we saw Rafi, and my daughter wanted to go up and say, give him a hug. And he's, he's a real cool guy, you know. This on this kind of hippie commune sort of island on the west coast of Canada, but yeah. So Rafi's Canadian? Well, actually, Rafi, I think might have come from lebanon originally i think he's from the middle east he's from far far away and it, it, there's quite an interesting story about how, i guess how he became a singer but it wasn't what he was planning with his life but yeah hmm. it was it was fun when we saw him he was at the salt spring market there on a saturday and he was selling books and but it was just the funniest thing was it was just every little kid wanted to come up with this guy and this is sort of this guy he's He's kind of got this zen-like feel to him. He's just super calm. And the kids would just come up and hug him. It was pretty cool. But, yeah, I don't know why he didn't do a polar bear song. I guess we've got to talk to Rafi. Yeah, yeah we'll have to really? have the right one. Maybe yeah. Maybe he can get together yeah. with the narwhal narwhal people and they can, uh, you know, have a dual hit there or whatever. <laughs> well, guys, uh, that's uh, it here for the polar bear cam. It's getting dark. It's... Uh, it's almost dinner time for us here on Buggy One, so thanks for tuning in for another good day of uh, bear action on the polar bear cam. Check us out tomorrow. We'll be doing the same thing, uh, looking for polar bears in the greater Churchill area. So thanks for everything, and uh, we'll chat with you soon. Sure hope we can get home before it gets dark. Yeah, me too, Steve. <laughs>